Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on mastitis management on your organic dairy with Dr. Guy Jodarski. My name is Deb Haliba and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and upcoming and recording webinars at eExtension.org slash organic underscore production. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Guy Jodarski is a veterinarian based in Nielsville, Wisconsin. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Wisconsin at River Falls and his uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Dr. Jodarski was an owner and partner of a large animal practice in central Wisconsin for 12 years and has also worked as a staff veterinarian for companies that supply nutritional supplements and livestock health aids. Since 2007, Dr. Guy has been a staff veterinarian for the Organic Valley Crop Cooperative. Dr. Guy, thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. And today we're going to talk about mastitis and specifically mastitis on organic dairy herds. And this could be, you know, I, I am a bovine practitioner, a cattle type person, and so uh, most of what I say is about cattle, but this also directly applies to the other dairy uh, ruminants, the dairy goats and dairy sheep. Um, and so well, let's go right to it. And, and this uh, slide here, this is a, a book put out by the National Mastitis Council. The National Mastitis Council is a, is a group of uh, academic and industry um, folks that work on mastitis problems and they meet every year. It's a very good organization uh, oriented towards education. And so some of the material you'll see in the next few slides will be pictures from, from that book. Mastitis, its definition, talking about mastitis prevention, somatic cell count reduction, how we do that, how we, how we uh, handle those problems on organic dairies. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about organic treatments of mastitis and then a little finish up with a comment or two about uh, general health promotion, uh, which is really the organic approach, how we prevent things in the, in the big picture. Okay, so mastitis is basically uh, the number one disease of dairy uh, cattle, and so it, it doesn't matter if you're conventional or organic, mastitis is a very common problem, and what it means is infection or inflammation of the mammary gland. Uh, the uh, itis, of course, is inflammation, and mast refers to the mammary gland or the breast. And so uh, when we have infection, we have uh, inflammation, that's what mastitis is. And it's almost always caused by infection with microorganisms, and those are usually bacteria. There are a few yeast and uh, um, algae and things that be odd infections, but really bacteria are the biggest thing. And then we'll go into the next uh, talking about the, the classification of the different types of mastitis. And so subclinical is a topic that is a term that we use for mastitis where we don't see any visual signs, we don't see swelling, we don't see changes in the milk, but it's very important because subclinical mastitis means there's an, uh, an increase in the somatic cell count. We'll talk about the somatic cells. And what that does is it, it takes down the quality of the milk. And uh, so there's these changes, white blood cells come into the udder. And also, there's also some changes uh, with the milk secretion itself, so it actually gets more uh, salts in it, and so the conductivity, if you've heard of conductivity meters, would also change in subclinical mastitis. We don't see any visual signs. Clinical mastitis, on the other hand, has a vi you know, visual, we can see, and it's a quite, quite a range of clinical mastitis. We can see mild cases where the, the gland is slightly inflamed, slightly enlarged. We can see uh, where suddenly a cow comes in and her uh, mammary gland is uh, is a quarter is uh, greatly swollen, it's hot, it's red, and, and the milk can have clots in it, it can have chunks in it, or it could even uh, progress to a point where it would be very thick like pudding or thin like water. And so uh, clinical mastitis is usually pretty obvious. Uh, these, these different divisions of clinical mastitis, we won't spend a lot of time on. Acute just means quick, it comes on suddenly. Uh, per acute is the really severe type mastitis is where uh, the E. coli, the toxic mastitis is some, some of the gangrenous mastitis where a cow could actually be down and not able to get up or they could actually die from mastitis. Uh, it's quite unusual in organic dairies, but it could happen. Chronic, on the other hand, would be uh, mastitis cases that are around for a long period of time. And so they can, uh, you know, it's just there and doesn't go away or it could go away and come back. Chronic cases can, can come and go. 
let's talk about milk formation in the mammary gland because this is the place where all the action starts. And so what we're looking at on, the, on this graph on the left-hand side here is the cross-section of a mammary gland. And this could be a quarter in a cow, it could be a half in a goat, very similar. And so what we have is glandular tissue, basically the milk secreting tissue makes up most of it. And they, it, it's organized in these little ducts called alveoli. Uh, these little pockets alveoli and they're connected by ducts to a cistern in the center of the gland and that's connected uh, communicates with the teat cistern and actually the teat orifice is right below that and so that's where the milk comes out and so that's the basic structure of the mammary gland. Uh, part B of this diagram is just a, a magnification of one of these alveoli and what we see is that the spot is lined by these epithelial cells. These are the cells that make them. These cells would get the news from the blood. The blood comes in. There's a lot of blood flow to the mammary gland. And then this, the uh, part of the blood, the serum, the plasma, would flow through. The cells would stay in the blood vessel. And the sugars and the amino acids and so forth, the, the precursors for the milk would come. These cells would make the milk and secrete it into this area for uh, movement out of the gland. One of the real interesting things uh, about the, the mammary gland are these muscle cells. These are smooth muscle cells, and they are activated by uh, oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone from the pituitary gland, and so when an animal, a mammal, has a milk letdown, basically there's stimulation uh, either of the gland or psychic stimulation that milking is going to happen, and uh, the brain will release oxytocin from the pituitary gland. The oxytocin will come down in the blood, and it will make these muscle cells contract. And what that does is it's like a hand squeezing around this alveolus, which actually pushes the milk out. And so when a cow has a milk let down, you often see the gland starts to swell, and sometimes the cows will actually drip milk. Okay, so what is mastitis? Mastitis is bacteria getting into the mammary gland, and what happens is the bacteria uh, get up through the teat canal into the milk, and what happens is, is mil milk is a great uh, substance for bacteria to grow in. So they multiply in the milk and uh, they grow in numbers. And the problem is they will actually uh, get up into the milk secreting tissue, into the alveoli here, and they secrete toxins. And that these arrows are meant to be toxins. The toxins will have bad effects on the cells. You can actually kill these cells or make them sick. And then that will change the secretion um, but then what happens is some of the, uh, the products of this, of this reaction are released into the bloodstream and that attracts more white blood cells to come in. So what we're looking at here is these are the white blood cells, uh, also called leukocytes, also called somatic cells, or uh, it has a lot of names, neutrophils. And basically they're white blood cells, they're there to fight infection. And so Normally, there's uh, quite a few of these cells are actually coming all the time. And so if we think about somatic cell count, it's the, the count of these white blood cells, the, every one of these cells. And somatic cell counts, we think they're very good in, when they're below 100,000. And that 100,000 is 100,000 of those cells per milliliter. And so that is per 30 drops of milk, 100,000. And so that's a low count. And so what happens when we have mastitis, we have this reaction is the counts get quite high. A lot of these uh, white blood cells are attracted and so we can get the counts up into the millions. And so uh, this process of attraction is called chemotaxis. But uh, that's a, a fancy way of saying that they, they know there's something going on and they're coming to help. And so uh, we'll go to the next slide and we'll actually look at one of these uh, leukocytes, one of these um, white blood cells and uh, see what it's doing. Because what, 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 what the white blood cells do, their job is to eat the bacteria to control the infection. Basically, this is a white blood cell, and you can see that this is the outline of one cell. This whole thing in the picture is one cell, and these cells are very small. They're about 10 microns, and a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. And so it would take uh, 100 of these cells to line up uh, side by side to make one millimeter. So you, you can't really see them with the naked eye. Uh, a head of a pin is two millimeters. So it would take 200 of these cells to make uh, the head of a pin. And what you see is uh, these cells are actually, this is a, a real high magnification of the cell actually is engulfing the bacteria. Okay, the, the cell puts out uh, little projections from its uh, outside and it almost acts like arms to engulf the bacteria and they actually take the bacteria in and they'll bring them into their their body and they have these uh, 
these organs that are look like a they're like a stomach. And so these little dots, all these dark dots, are bacteria, and these are bacteria that that the that the, this white blood cell has has taken in, has eaten them up. And what it does is in this uh, in this uh, phagosome, it's called uh, hydrogen peroxide is produced, which kills the bacteria. And so these, the job of these cells is to come in and eat as many bacteria as possible, uh, and then they die. And so that they, we need a lot of them because there's a lot of these bacteria. Okay. So now we'll talk about entry of the um, bacteria into the quarter. And so this is a real key slide here. So this is a, a and whenever I use people's slides, I like to credit them. This is Dr. Stephen Nickerson, and he is uh, at the University of Georgia, and he talks a lot about mastitis. And the, he has these these slides are very uh, stylized, real easy to understand, and so I really like like his slides. Uh, he gave this talk a few years back at the Southern Dairy Conference, and so you'll see several of the slides from that presentation here today. But basically, what we're talking about is now this is the teat, and the teat cistern here where the milk is, and the teat canal. And what has to happen is the bacteria has to enter to get into the teat and then into the udder. So the concept here is that the more bacteria, the more likely they're going to get in. And it's a very simple concept, but this is really important because all our control efforts really are going to come down to how things work at this teat end. And so you can imagine uh, the, the health of this teat end is very important. And so the skin, if the skin gets roughened, if there's uh, too much vacuum and uh, the ends of this, of this uh, thing stretches out, um, it will actually grow a lot more bacteria if it's rough. And so that'll cause more of a chance for bacteria to get in. Likewise, if the teats are dirty, there's a lot more bacteria present, and then they're more likely to get in. It's basically a numbers game. The more bacteria you have on the teeth, the more chance you're going to have of, of mastitis. And so it's really about keeping those numbers down. Now, again, this, this, this is a very helpful diagram, but remember, these dots are really uh, very huge compared to a bacteria. There's probably a thousand bacteria would fit into the area that you're seeing on one of those dots. And so these these bacteria are are the numbers are are really staggering. There's just a lot of them around. And normally there's a lot of them that live on the skin. Even on healthy skin, there's some bacteria. And so uh, that's a, a normal thing. So one of the things we do is we culture bacteria in milk to see what kind they are. And basically the bacteria break down to two different types, the contagious type like Staph aureus, Strep Ag, uh, or the environmentals, which are in the environment, in the bedding, in the manure. Uh, it, the bacteria, again, are so tiny you can, but when you let them grow on a plate like this, this is a plate, uh, the, the colonies, thousands and thousands pile up and you can see them then on, on the plate like this. And so uh, that is a, uh, this is a quad plate, which means it's four parts, and so there'd be media and so we can tell different types of bacteria depending on how they grow on that. But again, the main point here is contagious are like staph and strep egg and they live in the udder of infected cows and so they, they when at milking time that's how it gets transferred. The environmental on the other hand are the streps, the E. coli, uh, the fecal streps, the strep species, the staph species and those are really going to be dependent on how clean we keep the cows in the environment. So we can do a bulk tank culture and we can see if we have contagious or we can see if we have environment. That's the main categories that we would go by. Okay, so this is the, the uh, bacteria under a microscope. And I just like to show this because it helps uh, sometimes to have a visual of what bacteria are. Again, they're teeny tiny. Uh, remember that, 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 uh, that, that tiny white blood cell, how big it was compared to the bacteria. And uh, it's interesting because the, the bacteria are stained with a uh, uh, what's called a gram stain. And so they're either gram positive or gram negative. Dark blue or black is gram positive. And then without, with the reddish is gram negative. And the name Staphylococcus, uh, Staphylo is a Greek term, which means a bunch of grapes. And so doesn't that look like a bunch of grapes? Doesn't that look like a bunch of grapes? And so looking under the microscope, a lot of times we can tell what kind of bacteria we have. Strep, strep means uh, twisted, and so it's like in streptococcus. Coccus is a round sphere, and so strep is in chains like this. Uh, and, and so uh, that's the streptococcus, the staphylococcus. Here we have E. coli or a gram negative. This is what they would look like. They're called a gram negative rod. They're more long, elongated, although you will see some that look like cocci. But this is just to give you an idea on what's, what it looks like under the microscope. Here's another strep where it comes in pairs, and that would be called like a diplococcus. Okay. 
So again, the staph, the strep, the E. coli, gram stain, is just to get you a visual of what the bacteria are like. Because I think a lot of times we have a hard time visualizing what bacteria are and how small they really are and how numerous they are. They're really um, all over the place. Um, we're talking now about mastitis detection, and visual is the is the main way that people would would look and. Uh, uh, so again, we look at changes in the milk, we look at changes in the gland, and so the, the, the swelling in the gland is very obvious. A strip cup is a nice tool to have. It's very nice uh, because it, uh, you can see, there's a screen here, you can see if there's flakes and things that might be harder to see. The other thing is you don't get the milk all over on the ground, uh, which could contaminate another cow. This is the California mastitis test. Most of you are familiar with this. Very, very uh, useful tool. I really recommend people use the California mastitis test. And what it does is it, it lets you see high cell counts because remember, subclinical mastitis, you're not going to see the flakes with the strip cup. But when you put some milk in each one of these wells and you add this solution, it's basically a detergent that breaks open those white blood cells. The white blood cells I showed you are full of DNA. That DNA is sticky. What it does is it, it clumps up and it makes a clot in that in that milk. And so you can see which quarters are high with that sample. Go ahead and advance. And so these are the visual techniques that we can that we can do. The next uh, slide is going to be about uh, taking lab samples. And so oh, this is a collection right here. And basically, this, this person is uh, stripping the milk into a sample bottle. And we could do this for either culture or just somatic cell counts. Uh, they're using good technique. They're wearing uh, the milker's gloves. And the thing about doing these culture samples is we really need to be careful how we take the samples. We've got to use alcohol and swab the teats, make sure they're very clean, and make sure we strip the milk to the side. Because if we have any dirt on the outside of this teat and we brush it off a little piece of dust and it falls in this bottle, it's going to culture as an environmental bacteria. It's going to culture as a staph species or a strep species or an E. coli. And we really want to know what's in the milk. We don't care what's on the teeth as far as the bacteria. And so taking those samples is really critical to take them uh, in, a, in a good manner. OK, go ahead and advance. And here's another culture plate with some different uh, bacteria growing out on, on the plate here. So the next uh, thing we're going to look at here is a uh, report on somatic cell count. And uh, this was a, a herd in Pennsylvania earlier this summer. And what you'll see is the cell count. When we take these bottles, take them until then they get counted. Um, then we come up with a report. And uh, this report would be uh, a listing then of the cows and their cell counts. And some of you probably get this, probably get a monthly test from DHI. But it's a very, very useful type of uh, uh, tool to use for controlling somatic cell counts. So here's the report. And what we see is that these cows are ranked. Uh, th there's more cows below here, but it is dropped for the sake of, of being able to see it. And so we've got some cows here that are, hey, this is 1393 and 1600. That's 1 1.39 million, 1.6 million somatic cell count. And then we have, you know, um, these cows are all below 100,000 here. Uh, the interesting thing about these reports is that you can uh, you can look at, they can figure out uh, how much these cows each contribute to the bulk tank somatic cell count. So if the top cow there, Jennifer, even though her cell count's a little less uh, in, in number, she's giving 102 pounds of milk way over in, in the left column over on top there. Uh, whereas Rachel is given 80 pounds milk. So that's going to make, she's going to make a higher contribution to the bulk tank somatic cell. And what we see in the far right column is the, the percent of um, somatic cells in the bulk tanks. And so we see these top two cows, uh, Jennifer's 31%, Rachel's 28%. And so there's 59% of the bulk tank uh, somatic cells are coming from those two high cows. And in small herds, it doesn't take one or two cows to really bump up the cell count. And so if this ball tank, for example, was at 300,000, uh, if you pull these two cows out, we're going to be less than 150,000 because we have over 50% of the cells from these two cows. So uh, a very useful tool. And so uh, definitely recommend if you're having problems. And even just a good monitoring tool is, just, is a monthly testing like this. If you don't do the testing, uh, at least getting that CMT paddle out on a monthly basis and, and checking uh, cows that you're suspicious of or checking all the cows every once in a while is a good tool. Um, that CMT paddle, I would like to see that used on every fresh cow. Um, and so every cow, when she has a calf, she should have the CMT test. And then um, 
before they go dry is a good time to do it again. And so, uh, yeah, you did try to advance the slide, I take it. So use that California mastitis yes. test. It's a, it's a really uh, good, it's a good tool. Are you able to move it or not? Um, it's showing conventional wisdom applies to organic systems on my yes. screen. Is that yes. what you? Oh, it's you, just not showing on my. Okay, maybe it's not coming up fast on my computer. Okay. Uh, okay, yes, and this is Dr. Hugh Kerman's slide, and basically it just says that these tools, these techniques are very important, um, and so uh, it doesn't matter if you're organic or conventional. Clean cows are important. Somatic, you know, the uh, the uh, CMT paddle is important. All these things are good. Okay, so here we're talking about the mastitis triangle, and basically uh, mastitis prevention comes down to these three main categories, the man, uh, the environment, and the machine. The man is the milking procedures, the people doing the milking, the environment is where the cows are, how comfortable they are, and of course the equipment is the milking equipment. Um, it's important to take care of all these factors. Uh, under the environment, I've got clean, dry, comfortable, and then also EMF stress is electromagnetic field stress. Some people would call that stray voltage. It's important to make sure you're not experiencing that if you're having chronic high somatic cell or high, or you know, repeating mastitis cases. It's, it's important to rule those things out. Other factors, nutrition is important. Um, you know, trace minerals, vitamins, very important. Milking order, especially if we have cows with staph aureus, we want to milk them last. Uh, or we want to know who they are so we can disinfect before we go on to those, uh, but that's important. And uh, dry cows and heifers, their environment is really important. If they're in a dirty environment, we're going to have a lot more problems with fresh cows. Basically, people milk uh, cows in all different sorts of uh, environments. Always the, the people are the most important factor. The milkers, uh, the, the, you know, the, the doing a good job, following the routine, no matter what sort of system you're milking in, um, it comes down to the people doing the job that are really important. And uh, again, we really are fans of, of the milkers gloves. We, we like to see uh, people wear those. Um, make sure that they clean the teats off properly, dry the teats well. Are you on that next slide? Yep, milking procedures. Okay, okay. Sorry about the delay, Dr. Guy. And so yeah, it's okay. I should maybe have mine up and just going through. I could I just you know remember each one. So okay, so here we got the the milker gloves and the towels, and uh, you know drying the teats is very important. Uh, either a cloth towel or or a uh, uh, individual paper towel. So you know the top point provide a low stress environment. I think handling the cows is really important that they don't get excited, that they're calm, uh, because that that oxytocin release is dependent on the cow being relaxed. Uh, if they tense up, they're not going to release the milk as well. And then all these other things we've talked about, and we're going to go into some of these things uh, directly. So let's go right to the next slide then, and we'll talk about uh, preparation and going back to that concept of that teat end. And uh, basically, what we see, you know, it's so important to get that the teat end clean, um, and so because that's the point where all the action is, that's where the bacteria get in the cord. I didn't mention it earlier, but uh, the the thing about the bacteria is they don't really have ways of moving. They don't have legs. They don't. They can't crawl into the into the udder. And so basically, they're dependent on movement of the animal. They're dependent on water, and so uh, it really is the physical. Uh, Keeping those numbers down in the end of the teeth is, is, I can't emphasize that enough. If we uh, don't do a good job cleaning the teats up, uh, the milking machine will. Uh, the milking machine is a, a great teat washer, and so if there's any dirt on the outside of the teat, it's going to get into the milk. And so this is this uh, kind of says that we really need to do the job for milk quality to clean up those teats very well before we ever put that milker on. Cool. Pre-dipping has gotten to be very much more popular as a uh, tool for uh, getting cows ready to milk. And so if there's, uh, it does help. The pre-dipping is, is really good for cutting down bacterial numbers, but it has its limits. It's, it's not a panacea. It doesn't uh, totally um, take care of the problem. We still got to get the dirt off if there's dirt there. And this slide really shocked me the first time I saw it. 40 to 50% effective. And so 
it knocks the numbers down in half, but it's not a sterilizing agent. It's not, you know, and so I think sometimes people get the misconception that if the cows are dirty, we just pre-dip and wipe them off and we're good to go. And we really have to get the dirt and manure off because this is only going to take off about half of the bacteria. And so, uh, again, it's really important to get them clean and dry. Go, we, what we want to do is make sure that we don't go back to that clean, dry teat with a hand, either a bare hand or a milker's glove hand, because there are bacteria on the hand, and they will come back uh, onto the teat. And so, if we're going to four strip, four strip before you pre dip, or if you can't, you know, some people say, well, there's no milk there, I can't pre dip, I can't uh, four strip until I get, you know, do something to stimulate them. Uh, go ahead and dip and have the milker's gloves on. Work that dip into the teat skin and then strip and then wipe it off and dry. But once the thing is dry, the milker goes on next. Do not, do not touch it with the hand because, again, the hand can introduce bacteria. Basically, the post-dipping is a, uh, a way of uh, getting that teat so that it doesn't support bacterial growth after we take the unit off. Half aureus is a, a bacteria that gets deep into the, into the quarter, and it can... Um, Come, it, it, it can shed uh, different times. It can be shedding all the time, or no, or some cows will shed that for you and not shed it for a while. So it's a little frustrating sometimes. But basically, this is that contagious bacteria, highly contagious to other cows. And uh, what happens is the cow will, uh, the, the bacteria will get into the liner uh, of the of the milking unit, and when we take this to the next cow, it will carry the bacteria there. And so a couple ways uh, it can infect the, the new cow, uh, this is why we always talk about milking these cows last, is that we, it can, if you have a slip where one of these uh, teat cups falls down and the air slips in there, uh, it'll, you'll hear a noise, a uh, squawk they call it, and what happens is you'll actually get enough pressure that you can actually eject the milk up one of the other uh, quarters and, and actually uh, just kind of... Uh, spray it right in, in at the teat orifice and so that's a real dangerous thing but even so even if that doesn't happen if it's a staph aureus cow go to the next slide and, and it will have it show you that the uh, the inflation has some staph bacteria left in it from from this cow that was infected and so this is a contagious object now when it goes to the next cow it can definitely infect her and so the big thing is to uh, like again if we can milk these cows last let's do that uh, if you have a stall barn and you have several staff cows, maybe you want to take a unit or two and just make that for staff cows. And uh, if you're in a parlor and you're not going to separate the cows, put leg bands on them so you know who they are. And what we need to do is we need to clean this inflation before we go to the next cow. So we could rinse this out and we could use a, a mild chlorine solution. We can go up to about 100 parts per million uh, without uh, you know having a problem with milk residue. So a mild chlorine solution to rinse this out would be one way to do it. But what we're, now we're talking about post-dip. Go to the next slide, please. And the post-dip, what that's going to do is, you see, after, the, after this staff is put on to the next cow, it's going to be on the teat skin. It shows that. And then over time, the bacteria multiply. And as they multiply, then it's going to, again, there's more teat, more, more bacteria at the teat end, there's more chance they're going to get in. And so um, that's where post-dipping comes in. Post-dipping is going to uh, take that milk film off of, because there's a milk film left after milking, and it's going to take that off and uh, cut the bacterial numbers down. So post-dipping is very important. So this next one basically is just about in organic, we have iodine is generally used, uh, in, and most uh, iodine dips, a lot of iodine dips are allowed. We always have to go to the certifier and check to see if they're allowed, uh, if the dip's allowed. And so um, that's an important point is to uh, go to the certifier and make sure that your dip is going to be okay with them. And then skin conditioners are also a, a, a another possible uh, point here that's that's important um, and so we do we do like to see more conditioners in the uh, in the in emollients in the teat dip in the uh, in the winter time and uh, that helps that skin condition we want to really keep that skin condition um, in good shape basically you know what this shows is uh, that you've got a, a smaller cow in, in a big stall and she gets the manure on herself and we're just going to have to do a lot more work on that cow um, because we've got to get that uh, 
we've got to get that dirt off. You know, we've got to, the, the, you see the manure down by the, the quarters on the teats. And so that's an um, important thing to um, uh, get that off to get those bacterial numbers down. These scores are based on the amount of dirt and manure on the teat. And uh, as you can see, as the scores go up, the somatic cell count goes up. And so it just makes sense. The bacterial count goes up uh, with each one. And so we're just looking at how much percent of the udders. And it always amazes me, too, when I look at uh, Hordes Dairyman or something and I see uh, on the cover of Hordes Dairyman and I see um, you know, how dirty some of the udders are on, on the pictures. And so this is something we really, really need to do a good job with, keeping those cows clean. And so it, it's going to pay off in somatic cell. Go ahead to the next one. And it's just a summary about environmental mastitis and um, just, just a common sense point. It really is just uh, just saying keep them clean and dry all the time. That's basically what it's, what it's saying. And uh, the equipment is basically, um, you know, we need to test the equipment. There's a vacuum levels are very important. So there's got to be measured and um, they can be done uh, when the cows aren't milking. We can do some of this baseline stuff. We can check the pulsators. We can do a, check a lot of things. But the, the other point here is that we need to check the milking system during milking time, especially if you're milking in a stall barn with a high pipeline because uh, the load of the milk lifting changes the dynamics of, of the whole system. And so you really have to have somebody come and measure. If you're, if you're suspicious of equipment problems, you really should get somebody to do a good job and measure during milking time. And so those are the mastitis triangle, the, the basic, the people, uh, the environment, and the equipment. And so we want to talk about uh, some of our goals for this, and we want to talk about uh, this case selection, the tools. We'll talk a little bit about what you can use, um, and then avoiding residues, which is a big topic. Okay, so the goals are um, basically we want to get the cow better quick. We don't want to spend a lot of money doing it. Uh, we don't want to have residues, and uh, we also want to protect the calves. People always ask the question about, can we feed high cell count milk to calves? And I think you can, but you got to be careful because uh, it could have contagious bacteria in it, especially if we have Staph aureus. And what we want to do is, uh, if the cow, if, if the calves are by themselves, and individually drinking the milk, that's fine. Um, because the milk, the bacteria, uh, they go to the stomach, they go to the intestines, they're going to be digested. The problem is if there's milk around the mouth of the calf and it goes and sucks another calf, if they're in a group situation, that's when we can get transfer of the bacteria. Also, uh, flies are a big thing. So as far as calf milk goes, if you're going to feed high somatic cell count milk, be careful leaving it around in buckets and stuff in the summer. Make sure you clean it up so the flies don't get at it because they will carry Staph aureus. That's been shown. So a case selection, the big questions are, are how, how long have we had this infection? Because if the earlier you get on it, the better. How old is the cow? Older cows will have more established infections that are hard to get rid of. Uh, this third point of sickness, that would just be the, the real toxic ones. That, that we would use some of the conventional medicines. We can use the fluids. We can use the, uh, the uh, flunixin, which is the trade name banamine. Uh, and there is you know, the cow can stay organic, and there is a, a, a prolonged withhold on that. Uh, but there, there are things we can use for those sick cows. They don't need antibiotics. Uh, and then, you know, how many quarters are affected? If the cow's got three or four quarters, it's not as good as if it's one quarter. And if they've treated them and they come back, well, it, it, you know, especially if it's a staph aureus, they may have to go down the road. And so these questions affect our, our decision. Okay, so this is uh, Dr. Ron Erskine. And uh, this was a meeting I went to several years ago, and he basically he said that it's the immune system. And back to our, our friend, the white blood cell, you know, it's, it's the immune system that does it. It's not the antibiotics. And so uh, go to the next slide. And basically, this is a, a slide of Scandinavian countries. And uh, the, the main point here is that, uh, you know, dry cow treatment. When I was in vet school, we were taught that uh, every cow should be dry cow treated with antibiotics in every quarter. And what this slide shows, uh, this is actually a little bit dated now, it's 2000, 2001. And, um, but what it shows is that uh, even in Norway where they just use a very small amount of dry cow therapy and you know they probably use even less at this point, it's been 10 years, uh, their somatic cell count, if you look at the graph on the left on the bottom, the, the somatic cell count for the whole country is, is uh, right around 100,000. And so 
it, it can be done without antibiotics, that you don't have to use the antibiotics. And so uh, and this is another Steve Nickerson slide. And basically, um, this is, uh, this is uh, saying that we got to get on it early. And in organic, it's even more important because uh, the longer that, that these infections stay in there, the less likely we're going to have to get a cure. So that's a you know, pretty simple point. We can move to the next slide, please. And these tools are, are um, they are basically uh, what we have in our arsenal, different categories of things. And uh, you're not going to use all of them. And this isn't just limited to mastitis. These are the, the, tr the tools that we could use for any sort of uh, infection uh, or problem. And so uh, these are the things we use all the time for pneumonia or mastitis or any other thing. Um, that we have infections in, in cattle. And so vitamin and mineral supplements are sometimes helpful, especially high cell count cows, sometimes extra vitamin A, D, and E, sometimes extra selenium, or there's an even injectable um, zinc and copper, manganese, selenium combination. Uh, the synthetics, we talked a little bit about flunixin and fluids for toxic cows. Vaccines, not so much vaccines, uh, uh, but biologics, the immunoboost is definitely something that people use. And then the, the herbs and plants, huge area, a lot of different things out there. Antibacterial tinctures with things like garlic, things like golden seal. Uh, there's all these different things out there. Aloe vera for immune support. We'll talk a little more about topicals, uh, essential oils in particular, because essential oils are uh, very important. And the whey products have a long history. They're, they're from colostrum, and they boost immunity. And so things like people may be familiar with the old Impro products uh, or the BioCell. Uh, there are different whey products out there. Um, antioxidants and homeopathy. Homeopathy, of course, is a whole other branch, and it is a lot of times useful uh, for certain people like it and some people don't want to use it but it's one thing we can definitely use for organic and there's no concern about residue with homeopathy okay and so I, I, I hope I didn't disappoint you here because I'm not going to give you the silver bullet I'm not going to say this is the best treatment for mastitis what farmers do is they find uh, two or three products that they like a topical a whey product uh, a, a garlic tincture whatever and they use those products together and so you have to kind of figure this out as to which ones are going to work for you. And which, but there are literally, if you look at these different classes and the different products out there, there are dozens and dozens of products that people use for mastitis. And so, uh, I mean, it could be well over 100. Okay, so essential oils, and this is Dr. Sarah Slabby's uh, slide. And um, she has done a real good job with the... Uh, uh, essential oils and this is kind of neat because the, this is these again the culture plates you see there and what they've done is taken some essential oil and put it on the little disc and this is the way they test antibiotics by the way is they put them in the disc and they see how how much of a round uh, clear zone uh, around the, on the plate is cleared out that's areas where the bacteria can't live and so this tells you that it has antibacterial properties essential oils are very common uh, very powerful and you know any plant, any herb that you crush and it has a smell, that's the essential oil. It's the, the essence of the plant, the volatile uh, compounds that are very strong antibacterials. And so these are the, the main component of the liniments. Go ahead and go to the next one. And so uh, liniment is going to have uh, you know your, your mints, our mints, uh, mint oils, uh, the tea tree oil, those sort of things. Those are all essential oils. Okay, and this is just a, a, a couple list, and this is just for a reference to throw this in here. Uh, Dr. Rueg at Madison, uh, who's been big on the National Mastitis Council, and she talks a lot of, she's a, at University of Wisconsin, does a lot of mastitis work. She's done surveys of organic dairies and what products are out there. Uh, and so these are some references. Uh, Dr. John Barlow at, at uh, University of Vermont, uh, basically a commentary saying that we need to use some science behind these products. And so... Uh, that's his point, is that we can't just be concocting all these things and using them, but we have to know something about them. Go ahead, go ahead and go to the next slide. And I believe the next slide is a, a mastitis tube. It's like the, the only product that I will show you today. And I'm not endorsing the product. And, and, and in fact, um, I uh, um, don't really like the fact of, of putting treatments up the quarter for mastitis. I would rather treat the cow systemically. I'd rather give her some garlic uh, and, and liniment on the, on the udder. And so... Those are the things that I, I, um, 
I don't really care to, to infuse things in the quarter. I know uh, intramammary infusion is very popular with farmers because uh, it's very convenient, especially if you're milking in a parlor. You can do the treatment while the cow is there and you don't have to catch her again. And so I understand the, the drive for these things. But okay, and so basically this shows that Dr. Kierman has done a good job of doing a lot of science behind this. And so the big thing to me is that he does have a milk withholding time. And so I like that fact that he's done that in the next slide go ahead to the next slide and that will show how this milk withdrawal time was was developed basically the active ingredient in this tube is, is thyme uh, the thymol essential oil that's the essential oil of thyme and what they did is they actually did a study in goats where they used the phyto mass tubes and then they looked at the actually assayed for the thymol in the milk and in the in the serum in the blood of the goats and they determined how fast it got out of the system and basically it got out of the system very fast and that's why he can put in a, a milk withdrawal time of just 12 hours or a meat withdrawal time of one day. Well, you know, the nice thing is this is actually a scientific backed up thing. This isn't just uh, somebody saying, uh, you know, they've actually done some work here. And so this is an approach that I think would be good for people uh, if they're going to use, if they're going to make products and uh, use them for, for this sort of thing. I think it's, it's a good approach. So, okay, and so that Dr. Claire McPhee uh, did that and uh, did that study. When, she's a veterinarian now out working out in Washington on milk quality issues, but she was a grad student in, in vet, stu vet school at that time when she did that study. Okay, go to the next slide, please. You know, basically the concept is that we um, want to have a milk withdrawal time and so we're talking to our farmers more and more about this uh, in that uh, we don't want people to just uh, because say because it's natural we don't have to hold the milk uh, there is a, I know there are certain products on the market I even see magazine advertisements that say uh, keep the milk in treat the cow um, and this is liniment and so uh, I, I don't agree with that and the reason being is these essential oils penetrate into the quarter. They're not just on the skin. When you put them on, you need to wear gloves, milkers gloves, because they'll go through the skin into your body. Uh, uh, people that have used liniments probably probably know this from experience, so you can taste the mint after a while. Well, if you put it on one quarter, it's going to go into that uh, mammary gland and go to the other quarters. And so we've got to withhold the milk, even if we're just treating a high cell clone quarter. Now, you can use that milk, again, to treat calves with the precautions we talked about. But uh, we should, uh, the herbal treatments, uh, even if we're treating a cow for pneumonia, when we're giving her uh, garlic tincture, things like that, I want that milk withheld. And the big question is how long we don't have science behind a lot of this. So I think, you know, a 48 or a 72 hour milk withdrawal would be a, just a, a judicious thing to do. And so this is something we haven't talked about a lot in the past. And we, we talk about it at our meetings with our farmers. And we really feel strongly that we should keep, you know, we don't want to, of course, market any milk that has any visible signs of mastitis, but we don't want to market milk where cows are being treated either. That milk could, could you can use that for calves if you'd like, but let's not put that into the market because we want our organic products to be really, really clean and pure. So it, it all else fails, you know, we got to, sometimes we have to call and, uh, you know, the thing about calling is, uh, you know, if it's an older cow, she has multiple quarters of staph aureus, uh, the quarters feel firm, that means there's scar tissue, there's virtually no chance we're going to cure that cow. And so culling, remember the bottom point here is 100% effective. And so the, the, it always works. So culling is important. Go to the next slide, please. And I know it's hard to cull cows and, and uh, at times if you need the milk and things like that, but uh, it's amazing. Sometimes we have herds that it, that get rid of some of the, some of their worst cows, and their milk production doesn't really change that much. Or sometimes it even goes up because they were limited on space at the feeders and things like that, and they have less cows there, so the cows can eat better. Um, but we sure want the quality of the product to, to be there, and so the culling is is definitely a tool that we would use. Chairman slide, and so basically this says that you can use the nurse cow program. And uh, this has been successful on some farms where we've had uh, cows come in, especially first calf heifers with high cell counts, and they're put in a nurse cow group. Basically, this is a group of cows and calves that are run like a beef herd. The calves will, you know, the cow will have either two or three babies grafted onto it, and we don't milk these cows. They, the calves take care of themselves over the summer, and some of these cows that go through a cycle like that with high cell counts will come back the next time with low somatic cell counts. It doesn't always work, but it does work sometimes. It's, a, it's an alternative, um, and it really raises a healthy calf. So that works works very well that way. 
Um, we are concerned about staff aureus in this case, and we are watching. But at this point, you know, we've seen some staff calls go into the system, and we, some of these uh, calves freshen and not have staff aureus. So we're watching that, as, as, as it would be a concern. And of course, we don't want to do this with a Yoni's cow, a cow that tests positive for Yoni's disease. And so we had the mastitis triangle. That's straight conventional thinking. And I just want to make this point that organic, we go a step further. And basically, you know, the basis of our health is the soil. Uh, and, and the way we manage our cattle, go ahead and go to the next slide. And you know, it, what it comes down to with ruminant animals, the uh, top three things for health, and so this would be dairy cows, beef cows, goats and sheep, is a high forage diet, the grazing, and then the soil. And those three factors together are really what promote health. And so we, you know, as organic farmers, uh, if we get the soil balanced, if we have you know good living soil, we're going to have more nutritious crops. There's going to be more minerals in there, more energy. The cows are going to do better. They're going to have less mastitis. And so it's this holistic thinking, going beyond just thinking about the the, the mastitis and the mammary gland, is we think about the whole system. And so uh, again, it's the it's the high forage diet. We don't feed a lot of grain to our animals the grazing and the soil mineralization and biology. Okay, let's let's go to the next one please. And I just put this in here at the end just to show people that, you know, it can be done on organic dairies. And basically these are two of our herds, one's in uh, you know, east co east coast, west coast. Uh both about 100 cows, one's a little less than 100, one's more than 100. Um but really look at these uh, this is a monthly average cell cell count for two and a half years and what you can see the top herd there uh, their highest monthly average was 100,000, and so they're mo mainly under 80,000 year-round for two and a half years in this data. Uh, the herd on the bottom is even more amazing because they've never get above 60,000. They're mainly down in the 40 to 20 to 40,000 range with their cell count, you know, with with these cows uh, for a long period of time. So we can do this. It can be done without antibiotics. Uh, we have herds that do it. And it doesn't happen easy. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And there's like three or four bullet points. If you just can go right through all those bullet points at once, that'd be fine. Um, basically, um, it basically, you know, again, mastitis is this number one disease. And then uh, it, it takes diligence. The, the point of the, those guys that are, are under 100,000, nobody coasts to that. Everybody, you know, these guys that are really good with the low cell counts and less mastitis, they work at it. And so it does take effort to do that. Yeah, we again. This, this, this. Uh, you know, we talked a lot today about uh, about treatments and focusing on on those. You know, we talked about those classes of things. And let's put our focus on balancing soil, on good grazing, on good nutrition, and we won't have to worry about so much of that stuff. So let's let's really focus on the prevention. And I believe that's it. And we could go to the questions. So at the beginning of your um, PowerPoint, Dr. Guy, you talked about um, the udder, and it. This question says, can you tell us what makes the udder more muscular? In other words, harder to milk because less milk comes out. Okay, so you're talking about a firmness in the udder. And, and it, you know, muscular may not be the best term because um, even though we talked a little bit about that smooth muscle, it's not a muscular organ like an uh, arm or a leg or uh, something like that. So um, when you feel firmness, that is probably the result of scar tissue forming from fibrous tissue. And so that is often a bad sign. I mean, uh, when a cow comes fresh, sometimes there's uh, extra fluid there. There's edema. That will make things firm. Uh, but also with age and injury and infection, the, part of the inflammation process, part of the uh, resolution of mastitis is to deposit scar tissue. And so you'll get these quarters or, you know, even pole udders that really get firm or they don't milk down. And there's some variability in the composition of even healthy uh, mammary glands where some cows will milk down like a dish rag flat, they call it, and other ones will will be uh, still f fairly firm. So there's a little difference in, in individuals, but it, usually it's the result of scar tissue depositing. And that's not very reversible. OK. Um, could you just remind us what the approved dips are for organic dairy farms? Uh, uh, what, the question is about what dips are approved? Yeah. Yeah, and the specific dips, I can't give you a list. I, I do. I have kept lists from the different certifiers, but each certifier has their own list. And so um, I, the best thing is to talk to an organic farmer in your neighborhood and see what they're using and uh, talk to your route guy. 
uh, you know, whichever brand that you have in your area and what he supplies to the other organic farmers. Uh, but again, you need to check with your certifier. And so I, I'm sorry that I can't give you a list, um, but uh, they, you know, sometimes the, the certifiers will have lists, and uh, but they change too. So we've always got to talk to the certifier. In that general, iodine-based dips are where we start. Uh, you know, chlorhexidine would be if the iodine's not working. How do you keep from transmitting pathogens between cows using a communal teat pre or post dip container? Great question. A very important point. And so uh, we need to these these to the pre dipping or the post dipping. We need to keep keep those things clean. And so. Uh, what we'd like to do is use one that has a, a small amount of the dip that, that uh, at the you know after so many after we do a handful of cows we can dip the little bit of residue that's in the bottom of the well. Some of these have you can squeeze and the the the, the dip comes one way up into the the cup where the dipping happens. It never goes back into the reservoir. That's important. And once that gets low, you dump it out. Uh, you rinse it. If it ever gets dirty, put it in a pail of soapy water and wash it. And you should just wash them, you know, every you know every couple times a week or more often. Throw them in the wash vat with your other milking equipment and get them clean uh, with no dip in them. That's really important to keep those clean because there have been certain bacteria that actually survive in those dip cups and get spread by dip cups if they get dirty. Great, thank you. Do you have a preference for bedding in free stalls? Well, it, 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 the bedding and free stalls, I, uh, I would prefer uh, uh, enough bedding. And so that's, that's sometimes a question. If we have mats or mattresses, some people think we don't need any bedding. Uh, I sure like to see, you know, if we can get straw, it's beautiful. Straw is really nice. Uh, we don't like to use hay. Hay supports bacterial growth. Shavings tend to be expensive. They, they're really good if they're dry. Shavings are good. Sand in a free stall instead of mattresses works really well. Um, the only problem with sand that I, you know, other than manure handling is a big problem, but the other, only other problem with sand is it's very cold in the winter. And so uh, if the cows have got to be in on the sand free stall in the winter, they're not very comfortable when it's below zero. So uh, those are some of your options. I guess really what's local and available is really important because now mm -hmm. it's got to be organic. The straw has got to be organic or, yeah. Okay. Do other diseases add to somatic cell count scores such as lameness? That's a good question. So do other diseases like lameness, stress on the cows, increased somatic cell count? There's definitely some people talk about that and they think about, you know, stress, just general stress in the cow will raise somatic cell count. I'm not totally convinced that that's the case. I mean, if a cow is systemically ill and really ill, where it has a high white blood cell count, uh, the white blood cell count in the blood only even gets to 10,000 or 20,000. It, it, it doesn't ever get to these really high levels. And so um, it doesn't get to these millions. And so somatic cell count, you know, I would say 90 plus percent of the time is due to infections in, in the mammary gland. And so that's where we need to look. I mean, there's an old saying, if you hear uh, hoofbeats, don't look for zebras. Um, and I, th I think that's the case. I think, it, you know, there's some, some merit in, in the stress with elevating cell count, but I think we really got to go back to looking at other infections with bacteria. Okay, and do you find particular um, breeds more likely to get mastitis? Uh, not so much breeds, but individuals. And so uh, mastitis is, uh, you know, the somatic cell count is definitely heritable. And you guys, uh, farmers that have milked cows for years or generations, know there are cow families that have more mastitis. There are cow families that have higher cell count or lower cell count. And so there's a big genetic component to it. And that's part of that culling, I think, is that if you have... Uh, you know, cows that are consistently having problems, there is a genetic component. The immune system is very uh, influenced by genetics. And so individuals, I think there's a big difference. Uh, Breed-wise, I haven't noticed a big difference. I think they're all pretty much susceptible. And this one is related, and you might have just answered this, but do you believe the genomic score for somatic cell count relates to the resistance to mastitis, i.e. lower somatic cell count bulls will sire cows with more resistance? Okay, so there was two parts of this question, really, because you mentioned genomic and you mentioned uh, genetic traits for uh, somatic cell count. So there's two different things going on here. One is actual data collection where they're actually looking at the daughters of bulls and looking at the cell counts. And so that number is based on observations of, uh, you know, daughters and their cell counts. And I really believe in that because 
that's going to in large part be determined by uh, conformation. If the udder is high, if the teeth signatures are tighter, uh, if they milk out well, those cows are going to have lower somatic cell count. So there's very heritable that. The genomic side is, is science going to the next step where saying I can take a blood sample and identify through the genes uh, and say whether that's going to be true or not. And I'm not totally convinced about genomics at this point. I think it's interesting, it's useful, but I'd rather see that data where it's actually coming from daughters. Uh, that's a true number, whereas the genomic is kind of a prediction. And it, it's, the prediction is holding out in some cases, but you know how predictions are. They're kind of like the weather. They don't always hold out. Okay. Is it guaranteed that feeding staph aureus infected milk to heifer calves will infect the heifer when it, it when they come into lactation? No, and, and I, I'm sorry if I didn't explain that well enough. And it's it, it's a danger. It's not a guarantee. Uh, if you take the precaution of not having the cows the calves suck each other, and keep cleaning up the milk so the flies don't have access to the milk when the calves are done. You know, just a little bit in the bucket is all the fly needs. If you take care of those two things, you're not going to have staph aureus problems feeding staph aureus to calves. It, it doesn't come from the calf drinking the milk. The bacteria are in the milk, they go to the stomach, they get digested, they don't go to the, the baby calf's sutter. But if the calves are in a group and you have three or four and it's around the mouth of the calf now and they go and suck on another calf, they can transfer it. So it really depends on your system. Uh, but you, you know, a lot of people feed staph aureus milk without a problem. Again, the precautions are to not make sure the calves don't suck each other and clean up that milk so it doesn't sit around after the calves are done drinking. Um, and this one is somewhat related. We see serious damage to teat ends on calves that is caused by horn flies. Have you seen horn fly induced teat damage on mature cows? I have not seen it on mature cows. and. Uh, um, yeah, I have not seen that, but I sure it could happen. I mean, um, the horn fly, they, they do do severe damage and they, you could to the point where some of these, uh, heifers are not even milkable. And so that's a, that's a real tragedy. And so, um, horn flies, uh, generally feed, uh, I'm not sure if, it, if maybe it is the horn fly, but I'm not, you know, the horn flies are usually sucking blood on the animal. They're up on top of the back on their shoulders and also on the belly, um, but uh, some sort of, like, maybe there are horn flies that are actually eating, and I, I've seen some of these animals where the teats are damaged, and it's, it's a tragedy because uh, uh, that, that's terrible. Once you get damaged teat end, you're going to have bacteria growing there, they're going to have mastitis, or the teat may even be destroyed enough where it's not even milkable, so that is, a, that is definitely a problem. And is it okay to spray bottle with the dip instead of using a cup? Uh, spraying is okay. Uh, it's not as preferred uh, as dipping, and the reason being the coverage uh, is not as good, um, and it, it takes a lot of effort to get the spray on all four sides of the teat, whereas if you dip the cup in, you know that it's at that level in the cup. It's going to cover the whole teat. Where uh, spraying uh, is, is can be, I mean, if some people use spraying and they love it, and that's fine uh, if they if they can make it work. But it's really hard with hired help or stuff to make sure people are going to get the spraying done adequately. And so uh, I've used spraying with caution. I mean, it's, it's nice because you're not touching the, the dip cup to the animal, so you're not going to contaminate it. But the coverage is a big issue, getting the teeth covered. Okay. Is there a link between mastitis and the quarters emptying unevenly? Okay, say it again, please. Um, a link between mastitis and quarters emptying unevenly, and oh, this per okay, person says, so, uh, yeah. "Yeah, this person says I have a cow whose quarters empty unevenly, and she has had mastitis in the past." Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, and and you know the, those uneven quarters are very frustrating, and you know the the question is, do we spend time to milk them out, massage those quarters, and get them? Uh, if they don't milk out as well, they're going to have more mastitis problems for sure. And then the problem is if we, you know, start catering to these cows to any degree, they're, they're going to make us their slave. I mean, they, they're going to require that you do that all the time. And so, uh, you know, one of the dairy farmers uh, had a, this spring said a good thing. He said, if I have a problem in my herd and if it affects less than 5% of the cows, um, it may be a problem where I need to get rid of the, that less than 5%. If there's a problem health-wise and it's over 5% and approaching 10%, then I need to look at my management. So if this is a small proportion problem, you may need to do some selective calling to get, to get rid of those animals. 
Okay, this person says, yesterday um, afternoon we suddenly noticed watery chunks in the strip cup for every cow. Some, uh, California mastitis test was fine, no symptoms in the morning. Could this happen from dehydration as the water tub tipped over during the day? Boy, I don't know. Uh, that's an odd thing. It, it's a... Uh, um yeah, I mean, if they didn't have water, they were certainly stressed. If it was, a, you know, you know, it was hot here. I don't know where you're at, but uh, that could certainly be a stress, and that that may have caused the shedding of of these uh, the cells that what you saw. Um, but I gotta say, it's uh, it's not something that I've seen before, so uh, I'm I'm a little unsure. Uh, but I, I think it's very possible if you had that episode where the water was tipped over, that wasn't that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Um, this person is curious about garlic. Um, is it used as an oral or a rub? Or um, and then they ask, do you know who carries it? Uh, garlic is a is a systemic, and so um, you can give it orally. That's a good way to give it. Uh, you can give it in a tincture, or some people give it in the straight uh, the garlic uh, bulb or paste. Uh, and so it's one of those things where um, you can kind of do a little bit of a home remedies type stuff or there are any of the natural supply uh, places that, that uh, sell for organic farmers, sell farm supplies, will have garlic tinctures. Tinctures, of course, are stronger because it's extracted in alcohol and you're just using the alcohol, applying that in the mucous membrane, usually in the mouth, and it goes right to the bloodstream. When you use oral garlic, you got to use a fair amount because a lot of garlic gets broken down in the room, but there are people that use that just uh, take organic garlic bulbs and run them through a sausage grinder and make a paste, and they'll put that paste in the empty tubes, the uh, like the milk fever tubes, uh, and give that paste. They'll give a couple pulls of that paste to cows with mastitis or high cell counts. Again, we should be holding milk when we're doing these things. We should be feeding that milk to calves when we're treating with garlic. But garlic's very strong antibacterial ancient remedy used in human medicine since the Egyptians and the Romans. So it's a, definitely a, a good antibacterial. And does the garlic affect the taste of the milk? And if so, for how long? It could. It yeah. could. And, uh, you know, like I said, I would, I would go 48 hours after you stop. Um, and it doesn't always come through. It's kind of spotty uh, as far as, it, you know, if, if you... Uh, uh, treat a cow. It doesn't always. It doesn't always detectable. But again, if we're treating a cow, I would like to have that cow withheld and and used for calf milk. And so, uh, a bigger problem is cows grazing and getting into leeks or wild wild type onion type plants, and that will definitely come through in the milk, and that will result in rejected and loads of milk sometimes in the springtime. And what do you think about the process of killing a quarter just by banding um, the quarter? Well, it's not a very nice thing uh, to talk about, but it, it, you know, there some of the larger organic dairies do uh, would remove a teat uh, just to make sure. You know, if, if they're, cow, they're decided that they're going to uh, a chronic uh, one quarter in a cow's band, they're going to go to a three quarter cow. Uh, when you remove the teat, there's no mistake in the milker put, putting on the the milker on the wrong teat because there's no, none there. And then removing that in a humane fashion is very important. Um, you know, just cutting it off would not be an option because that, of course, would be a lot of blood and pain. Uh, the banding is kind of nice because it strangulates it. It does it does make it uh, numb, and you don't get as much bleeding. And so that would be uh, that's an option that people use. Uh, not a very nice thing to consider or talk about, but it would be more humane than actually amputating the teeth. So um, there are people that that do do that. Um, as a matter of course, uh, if you're getting a lot of those, then we better be looking at the system and, and see how you know, we don't want to be doing, certainly doing very much of that. And, and uh, what do you think about staph vaccines for cows, for ca the calves, excuse me? Yeah, um, so the staph, uh, for and mastitis vaccines, and I didn't really talk about vaccines too much. I'm not a big fan of mastitis vaccines, especially for staph aureus. Reason being, uh, sometimes, they, you know, they work pretty well and sometimes they don't. And I think the problem is staph aureus is a family. And so there's a lot of different strains. If the vaccine strain matches your strain and your herd, it works really good. Other people use it and it doesn't do much. And so uh, the mastitis vaccine for staph is kind of uh, hit or miss. And the other vaccines, the... the uh, the ones for the toxins, for the JVAC and stuff, for the E. coli's, um, those are very good vaccines, uh, but most of our organic herds have low stress uh, and uh, very low uh, cases of these toxic mastitis, and so there are not many people in the organic uh, side that use those vaccines, but they are useful if you're having that problem. 
Okay, and, and this is a final question, I'm sorry to say, but um, what are your thoughts on stripping out an infected, uh, infected cow multiple times a day as a treatment? Yeah, it's great. I, I really would like that because it's that flow of milk. Remember when we showed the, the picture, the bacteria are coming up into the, into the quarter, and so the flow of milk is going to push the bacteria out, and so the more we can empty that quarter, that is a, that is a good treatment. And so uh, if the cow is ill, if there's a lot of swelling, we're going to have to do more than that, but there have been plenty of cases that have been cured with just stripping. And so some people have even used multiple calves with a, a cow with mastitis so that they really keep, the, they would, the calves would be doing the, the, the uh, stripping out, they'd be doing the sucking, but uh, that is a, a time-honored technique and, and uh, definitely a good one. If you can afford the labor to do that and have the time, I highly recommend it. Uh, you know, any, especially a flare-up with a with a hard quarter with an acute case. The more you can strip it, the better it's going to be. Great. Well, thank you so much. We are out of time, um, so I'd like to thank you all for your questions and mention once again that you can find the recording of today's session, uh, recordings of our other webinars as well as articles, videos, and more at um, eextension.org slash organic underscore uh, production. We do have a few webinars coming up later this fall. On um, October 17th, We um, Sarah Brown, who works with Organic Tilt, is going to be talking about the NRCS organic initiative and, and um, how that is affecting organic dairy farms. And then on November 14th, we have uh, uh, Dr. Daryl Emick, who will be talking about behavior-based grazing systems.